heart, set high goals, and achieve them. Thank you that you have already given us victory over everything we will encounter this year. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for everything that you've done and especially for what you're about to do. Father God, we are here with open arms and open minds so that we not only hear you, Lord, but allow us to see and feel you. Father God, times are changing like never before, and we need you. Your children need you. I need you. You're the only one in control. Lord, allow my teachers to be my teachers and not have to put their lives on the line. Allow my peers to replace fear with happiness this school year. Cover each and every student from all ages to grades. Father God, help my peers and I to remain focused on our education and grant our parents peace. Lord, anyone who is hurt and wants to harm others, heal them, Lord, and have mercy on their souls. Allow our leaders to do their jobs so that we can all breathe. We pray that the injustice of this world that goes unseen, that you bring it to the light. Father God, watch over my pastor, his family, and most importantly, this church. We thank you and we praise your name. Amen. Hi everybody, my name is Janelle Fitzgerald. Hi guys, I've grown up. It's so nice to see everybody. I am in absolute awe of our future generation. I am in love with kids. I love them, I love them, I love them. And I think it is very important to go into this next season um, with prayer. So let's go to God. Thank you Lord for the opportunity to be able to impact the children of today. Thank you for shining your light upon all of the administration, faculty, and anyone who reaches your children. Please guide them to be the men and women that you want them to be. Please keep them safe from any evil and grace their minds to know that you are the one in control. Teach them to be accountable, diligent, and hardworking. Please keep their parents' hearts and minds safe as they send their babies off into the world. Thank you for the love that you have granted into this world and please help the children to shine the light of your kingdom into the world. I pray for safe travels for everyone, students, and faculty that they may reach the destination that they are meant to arrive. Please keep the teacher's mind strong and help them to teach our children gently. Please help their patience and make them to be teachers that reflect you. Please help students to stay confident and stay strong-minded. Thank you for your love, mercy, and for your presence. We love and praise you. Amen. We got next. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to see another Sunday and giving us this day so we can serve you. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy toward us. Thank you for keeping us, protecting us, blessing us, and loving us. Lord, I pray for every young person in our church. I pray for their families, friends, associates, peers, and teachers. I pray for school success, good grades, victory in athletics, health in our relationships, strength in our bodies, and your blessings for our souls. Bless our college students, keep our college campuses safe. Bless our high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, even preschools, Lord. May this school year be the best school year yet. We believe you for victory. In the name of Jesus, amen. this family of faith, we greet you with Jesus' joy on behalf of our senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes III, and the entire Friendship West family. Again, we greet all of you visitors, members, family, and friends in the matchless and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tonight, the final night of our Youth Month, we're going to summarize, surmise, conclude what has been a, just a dynamic and very powerful month of where God, I believe, has showed himself strong and mighty through our young people, through the power of their worship and the power, more importantly, of their leadership. And I just want to delve a little bit into that tonight as we talk about the miracles from the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter. Come on in and hit that like button. You know how we do. Hit that like button. You can also hit share uh, across our social media platforms. You can subscribe, find out what's going on here at Friendship West and stay up to date 
by following us across our social media platforms. And again, make sure that you hit the share button because somebody somewhere needs to hear this word. They need to be blessed by what we're going to talk about tonight, the miracle of the nets as we go to the gospel of Luke chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. Now you already know what we need to do. You already know how to help us. Go ahead, get into the comment section, share, 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 uh, hit the like button. But before that, wherever you are, whether you're on the highway, of course, keep your eyes open. If you're in your living room, wherever you're watching us from, join us in a posture of prayer, in a moment of prayer as we consecrate our time together. Consecrate us now to your service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let our eyes look up with a steadfast hope and our will be lost in thine. This night, oh God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come into this house, to come into this place, to come into our houses and our homes. Meet us, oh God, in our living rooms, in our kitchens, in our cars. Meet us at our desks, at our workstations, oh God, as we endeavor to serve you in the beauty of holiness. We ask right now again that your Holy Spirit would be released, that we would hear and see you in a powerful way. Here on Wednesday, Lord, it's hump day. We're trying to get through the week. And Lord, someone needs a word that will sustain them, that will help them to run on and see what the end of the week is going to be. Some young person is in the midst, oh God, of getting back to school, getting back into the rhythm and into the swing of things. And they've encountered a snag and a snare. And we need a word that will give us guidance on what to do next. Lord, I'm praying for some family who was caught in the dragnet of indecision about whether to stay or to go. Lord, I need you right now to wrap your loving arms around them and out of your word, give us a word that will sustain us. We pray our, for our pastor, our senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III, Lord, and his entire family. Keep him safe. Keep him strong. Bring him back to us in September, restored and refreshed and renewed for the work ahead. These and all other blessings that we pray, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, according to your word, and count it done. Lord, 
Oh my goodness, I hope that y'all enjoyed that throwback, that throwback to our Transforming Life revival. Shout out to our Young Adult Praise team for just that reminder, amen, amen. Well, let's begin tonight by hopping in a time machine. We're gonna begin tonight by hopping in a time machine and going back to the year 1987. 1987, Ronald Reagan was president. A gallon of gas cost 89 cents. Doug Williams was the first, he became the first black quarterback that year to win a Super Bowl. The, my LA Lakers were NBA champions. Yeah, Whitney Houston was tearing up the charts, letting us know that I want to dance with somebody. And on August 29th of that year, uh, Deborah Peake married Frederick Douglass Haynes III. And so this year, our pastor and first lady on Monday celebrated 35 years of wedded bliss. And so we wish them more years and more love to come from now until eternity, amen. So make sure that you show pastor and first lady some love in the comment section, right? That love, as Shakespeare said, is an ever fixed mark. It looks upon tempest and is not shaken. And so we thank God for the work and the witness of our pastor and first lady as they celebrate this year, 35 years of marriage. Also, again, as I've said, this is the last Wednesday. Uh, of the month, the last day of Youth Month. Uh, and I want to first commend all of our young people for just doing an outstanding job, a tremendous job of lifting up the name of Jesus in worship and helping us to discern the times and what must be done through our courageous conversation. So I hope each of you have been blessed. I celebrate each and every young person again who helped us, every parent who sacrificed and taught our young people, right, the importance of sacrifice. And to our awesome ministry leaders, I've got so many, if I start calling names, I'm gonna forget, so I don't wanna do that. But all of our ministry leaders who served with excellence, even when things were not perfect, amen. And then of course, our support team, our support staff here, at Friendship West Communications, AV, everybody who chipped in and helped to make this an awesome month. A very special thanks, very special thanks to each and every one of you. This month for me has been a month that has been filled with miracles, filled with miracles. And as much as I love Smokey Robinson and the brothers from Detroit, I'm, I'm thinking tonight about a different kind of miracle. Uh, and having grown up in the religious context that I grew up in, I, I must admit that even with my uh, education and with all of the things that God has blessed me with, I still believe in miracles. I, I have to believe that, that I, I have to let you know that rather, that I am still a believer in miracles. And sometimes that makes me feel naive and sometimes that makes me feel foolish to still believe in miracles. Right? But as the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, he said, God have chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and have chosen the weak things of the world, he says, to shame the strong. So I stand here tonight a full-fledged believer in miracles. I believe that God can miraculously heal. I believe that. That God can miraculously deliver someone from addiction that God has the power, as we say, to do what exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think or dream or even imagine. But I also believe, that, that as I believe in big miracles, right, that the, that the blind can see, that, the, that those who are, are paralyzed or disabled can indeed be given the ability to walk. As much as I believe in big miracles, right, because I've been a, a, a steward and a recipient of big miracles, right, uh, if you had seen my report card after that first semester at Morehouse, you would know that God is indeed capable of big miracles. But as much as I believe in and expect big miracles, I also have come to learn and to discern and to discover that we often miss God in the small miracles and the simple miracles that God gives us in the dailiness of our living. And so I believe that this month has been a month of miracles from beginning with each and every prayer that was prayed on Sunday morning, which ushered us into the spirit of God in profound ways. Those were miracles, right? Yaman and Aaliyah and Trinity and Kennedy, they were all in their own way miracles. I, I believe that the way that God showed up 
for our young people in our worship and arts retreat. And then on Superhero Sunday, when Spider-Man started breakdancing. See, if you missed Spider-Man breakdancing, you missed a profoundly uh, dynamic and powerful miracle. I think about uh, Brother Jaden Stevenson, right, who uh, we, we were looking for someone who was going to lead the song without provocation, stepped up, and through the power of the Holy Spirit did his thing on Sunday morning in a dynamic way. Sister Caitlin Anderson, who was here more than anybody, Miss Caitlin was here more than anybody this entire month, pulled in so many ways, and yet when, even when we were trying to say, hey, let's have somebody else do this, she was insistent that she was capable of doing it, right? And so all of our young people showed up in profound ways, ways that I regard as miracles. There's also been the miracle of our new approach to our youth church experience. Go ahead and give me the uh, first slide. Give me that first slide, because I want to define, help us maybe define a miracle. A miracle is regarded from the Cambridge English Dictionary. I know y'all like Oxford, but from the Cambridge English Dictionary, we call a miracle an unusual and mysterious event that is thought to have been uh, caused by divine agency because it does not follow the usual laws of nature, an unusual and mysterious event that is thought to have been caused by divine agency because it does not follow the usual laws of nature. I want you to hold on to that definition tonight as we go through this Luke text. But there's also been the miracle of our new approach to youth ministry. Give me the next slide, which has been a tremendous blessing. Uh, this is from, I believe, our first event in April, our first uh, youth outing uh, in the month of April. And we have been praying uh, that God, you know, will continue to bless us. Give me the next one. Let me want to show the people the next one because the next one, it just got greater. And then uh, give me the next one because, yeah, it just got greater. So this is from last Saturday uh, for Hoops and Hope, uh, a, just a dynamic and awesome time with our young people. And one of the things that Reverend Michelle and I have been praying about is that, the, that God will begin to send us more young men to be a part of the ministry, that God will send us more young men to be a part of what God is doing uh, in Friendship West. And God answered us in a miraculous way this past Saturday uh, during Hoops and Hope. Give me that next slide. Uh, like a good youth pastor would, shout out to the Long White Sock Gang. Uh, like any good youth pastor, I went to bed on Friday night. I left the registrations open. There were 35 registrants. When I woke up Saturday morning, a miracle happened, and we were up to 45 registrants and close to 60 kids who uh, had signed up to be in attendance. And so Chloe, Michelle, Zoe, Glow, and I, we had not prepared for 60 kids. I need you to hear me tonight. We did not have enough food for 60 kids, and yet all was well uh, uh, on last Saturday. At least I thought it was well. Give me the next slide, because as it turned out that this outpouring of boys meant that the boys was going to be boys and completely not play fair. And so in a matter of minutes, what went from thank you, God, for this miracle went to, Lord, please help this disaster keep from turning into a catastrophe. And that, literally that fast. Lord, Thank you for this miracle turned into, Lord, keep this disaster from turning into a catastrophe. The boys completely decided they were not going to play fair. We tried to make the teams more diverse, which meant we wound, uh, we wound up with a situation where the boys would pick, like, one girl on their team and then not pass her the ball. We tried to let the boys play against the girls, and, of course, they didn't play fair. They just they blew them out. I mean, it was really bad, seven to nothing. It was looking so bad that I caught a couple of side eyes. I, I, I know uh, that, that if those young women had not been raised right, they, they would have tried to jump me. They, it was that bad in terms of the fact that here we were, a justice church, and we were experiencing gender injustice on the basketball court. Um, we tried to do everything that we could. Uh, the girls were absolutely heated. I preached about how faith is like a workout. And one of them came up to me, and I'm talking about from, a, came up to me, but yelling from across the gym, you should have preached about integration and justice because the boys would not play fair. They would not integrate their teams. And for a moment, I was bothered about uh, what it would look like, right? Again, that here we are, a justice church, and that we would have failed to do justice concerning our sisters, right? And that bothered me because here I am again praying, Lord, help this disaster not turn into 
a complete and utter catastrophe. I realized that what I had tried to do wasn't working and that what I wanted to work wasn't working like I had expected it to. And so I had resolved that this disaster was going to be a catastrophe. And like any good pastor, youth pastor, disciple pastor, just like a good pastor, I retreated to the kitchen. Zo was not done with the sandwiches, and so I could not feed my anxiety with food. I just had to sit with it. And so I began to pray about it, and the Spirit led me back into the gym where I found now the majority of the basketball being played on one side of the gym while the other side of the gym appeared to be empty. So now I'm really thinking, Lord, this disaster is getting ready to turn into a catastrophe. We've got half of the basketball being played that we had before. The other side of the court is empty, and so I got to go and investigate and find out what's going on. And when I got to the other side of the gym, I see that laying in the middle of the floor is a volleyball net, just laying there. I looked at the net, and of course, I tried to stand it up, only for it to, you know, fall right over because the volleyball net has no stand. And so surely, now surely, this, this, this disaster is getting ready to turn into a complete and utter catastrophe because I have the net, the kids see the net, but they also see that the net won't stay up. And now half the gym is taken up by a net that won't work and the other side of the gym is full of a basketball game of, of superstars. No one knew where this net had come from. Uh, Michelle didn't know where the net had come from. Glow didn't know where the net had come from. Chloe didn't know where the net had come from. And in my mind, I've got to find out where the net has come from because if I can find out who brought the net, then I can find the feet to the net and stand it up. And of course, I, 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 I leave the gym again and what happens next is just a blessing from the Lord. I want to talk about it tonight, but first I want to turn your attention to the Gospel of Luke and the fifth chapter, which contains a very, very familiar story for most of us. This is the text which tells us or gives us uh, Jesus' encounter with his disciples when he first calls his disciples. Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 1, ending at verse 11 from the Revised Standard Version. Excuse me. While the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon, he asked him to put out a little from the land and sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great shoal of fish or school of fish in some translations, a great catch of fish in other translations, and their nets began to break. The nets began to break. Verse 7 says, they beckoned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid henceforth. You will be catching men and women. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left 
everything and followed him. Let me just read that verse 11 for you, which is just so powerful for me. And when they brought their boats to land, after fishermen had been catching fish, they made a decision to leave everything and to follow him. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be unto God. Again, this text contains a well-known story, a well-known narrative of Jesus calling his first disciples. Simon, who was later called Peter only, and then James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They're all fishermen. This is a story about discipleship, but we should be clear the disciples, even though I believe that Jesus had to be a great preacher. I mean, I mean, I just believe that Jesus had to be a great preacher. But we got to be clear that the disciples do not follow Jesus because of his preaching. No, instead, they follow Jesus because he deals with them on their level and performs for them a miracle that they can understand by performing a miracle through fish. These are fishermen. Their life has been fish and fishing and boats and nets and water and waves and storms and tempests, tempests that love looks upon and cannot be shaken by. Their life has been daily waking up in the morning and tending to the nets and getting into the boat and launching out into the deep. This is what they do. They do fish. They know about fish. Fish is their life. They probably smell like fish. They, they are fishermen. They know something about fish. And I am sure that there were some mornings when they went out and believed that they would catch some fish only to come home at night and testify as they do in Luke chapter 5 that we have been at it toiling and working all night and have caught nothing. This is a text about discipleship. It's a text about the power of miracles that are found in our daily lives. It's a big miracle, but this is still a miracle that concerns itself with the daily living of the disciples. Their life is fish, and when God blesses them, when God reveals his power to them, he does it using what they understand, fish. It's a big miracle but it's centered on the dailiness of their lives. And again, we must ask ourselves, how many miracles do we miss expecting the big miracle while ignoring the simple one? Let me ask it again. How many miracles did you miss today expecting the big miracle, expecting the grand gesture, expecting the big miracle to happen, and by virtue of your focus on the big miracle, you missed how many small miracles did you miss out on? I want to tell you tonight that there are miracles happening all around us. The question is, are you paying attention to the miracles that are happening right in front of you? More importantly, here's another question. How do I experience simple miracles that happen in my daily life? That's what I want to talk about Tonight, I, I want us to focus on small miracles and to help us understand that there are indeed miracles going on around us if we can focus in, if we can find a way to turn down the noise, if we can find a way to avoid expecting big miracles and focus in on the small ones that God gives us day in and day out. I want to tell you that there are indeed miracles happening all around us. Give me the next slide. I want to tell you that, give me the, the last one. Uh, we experience simple miracles in our daily lives. First of all, when we are willing to deepen our trust in God through obedience, we are, we experience miracles in the dailiness of our living when we are willing to deepen our trust in God through obedience. Verse 4 of Luke chapter 5 says, And when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep or go further into the sea. Launch out 
into the deep. Go deeper than where you are. Move beyond the shallow shore where you are. Put out into the deep, Jesus says, and let down your nets for a catch. Listen to Jesus' request there. Go deeper. Go further. Push beyond the shallowness of the shore. As Peter will tell us, these disciples, or soon to be disciples, have been fishing all night long and have caught nothing. And so they are back near the shallow shore and have parked their boats. And as they have parked their boats, the scripture says that Jesus makes his way onto a boat. And when he gets onto Peter's boat, the first request is launch out so that I can preach. Yeah, launch out so that I can preach. And when he finishes preaching, he, he, tests, uh, 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 he tests Simon's obedience again by asking him to launch out into the deep, go further go a little bit further than you went the last time. Now, they have fished all night. I'm sure Jesus has preached all afternoon. I'm sure that Simon was tired, wanted to go home. But Jesus challenges him to launch out and go deeper. And far too many of us, I find, are contented to spend our spiritual lives near the shallow end of the pool. Far too many of us are contented to hang out on the shallow end of the depth of God. God is deep, so deep you can't get under him. So he's wide, so wide that you can't go around him. God God has depth, God has width, God has breath. And, And we, in light of the fact that God has width and depth and breath, are satisfied, far too many of us, to hang out on the shallow end of the pool of God's depth. Somebody ought to put that in the comment section, go deeper in God. There are so many of us who are satisfied and comfortable with the shoreline, and it makes sense. You can see the shore. There are some people who can stand to be on boats so long as they can see a shore because where there is a shore, they are in some ways assured of safety. It makes sense that there are people who are afraid to go deeper and afraid to go further. And there I am finding so many of us who are satisfied and comfortable with the shore, comfortable and satisfied with a shallow shore level of prayer. Far too many of us who are satisfied with a shore and surface study life as it concerns the scriptures and the things of God. There are far too many of us who are contented to hang around the shallow shore and gather understanding. I I have discovered as fishing is one of the things that I like to do. That, that one of the things that I learned about bank fishing is, sure, you can catch a sunfish or two near the shore. There are some fish that can be caught near the banks, but that the big fish are out in the deep. Yeah, the, the big fish are out in the deep, and you got to have a boat to go where they are. And I want to tell somebody who is listening to me tonight that God's desire for you is that you would deepen your heart and deepen your commitment and deepen your trust in him. But the only way that we can go deeper and further and farther with God is through obedience. Let me say that again. The only way that we can go deeper in God is to be obedient to him. As we said Saturday, as we were uh, in youth church, the problem with growth is that if you want to get stronger, the weights have to get heavier. Let me say that again. If you want to get stronger, the problem with growing, the problem with growing your body, the problem with growing in God is that if you want to get stronger, the weight has to get heavier. If you want to get bigger, if you want to get stronger, the weight has to get tougher to handle. Somebody, somebody can understand that because you're in a tough space right now. You're in a tough season right now, and God has placed heavy on you, not because you're weak, but because God wants to see you become strong. And the only way that you get stronger is that the weight get heavier. And similarly, we cannot expect more from God if we are not prepared to go deeper with him. 
Doesn't it sound silly for us to expect God to bless us from the depths while we stay on the shore expecting him? God, God is in the deep, and we want deep blessings. We want whale-sized blessings. We want shark-sized blessings. We want to be blessed from the depths, but we want to stay on the shore. I got to testify that a great example of this comes from this past Sunday. I asked Kennedy Henderson and Team Henderson to lead us in prayer on the fourth Sunday. And when I asked her, knowing her personality, I said, uh, the Spirit said, have her uh, ask her brothers and sisters to just go up and stand with her. I had no idea. I had no idea that when Kennedy and Team Henderson got up there, that they were going to allow the Lord to use them in a powerful and in a dynamic way. If you miss Sunday's worship, you need to go back and see Sunday. You need to start from beginning to end because when Kennedy got up with her brothers and sisters, she began to pray a prayer that reminded us as a community of faith that our worship and even our parenting is an act of justice. I need y'all to hear me tonight. She, they, they reminded us that our prayer and our worship is an act of justice and that through our worship, we as a people of God are called upon to center those who are not blessed like us, that we are called upon to remember to defend the fatherless, to care for the widow, to care for foreigners, to take care of strangers and to give preference to the poor. And all of that was a function of our collective obedience to God. I didn't know what I was doing by asking them to do that. I didn't know what I was doing by asking them to pray. And when they opened their mouth to pray, they had no idea that God was going to use them in that way. But all that was done was a function of our collective obedience to God's will. God will bless your obedience. And I'm speaking to someone to night who is still on the shore with God while God is beckoning you and inviting you to go deeper with him every week. Our young people have called us deeper and deeper into God through their prayer and through their worship into greater depths, into greater depths. They've called us away from the shore into the deep places of God. And I want to tell you that the miracles happen in our life when we commit ourselves to deepening our trust in God through obedience to what he already said. God has already given us his word. He's already given us instruction. The question is, do we have enough integrity to be obedient and faithful to what God has already said? I'm learning that if God wrote it, I can preach it. That if God wrote it, I can teach it. And the question is, am I obedient enough to what God says? I will never experience the miracle until I activate my faith through obedience, to obedience to reading the word, obedience to cultivating a prayer life, obedience Obedience in building community, obedience to God, to guarding our hearts and our minds, obedience in crucifying the flesh daily so that we can become more like him. We will never experience God's depth until we make up and make a commitment in our minds to go deeper in God through obedience. And while he had ceased to speaking, when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, put out your nets, put out into the deep. Let down your nets for a catch. Here's the next thing I want to share with you. Give me the next slide. Excuse me. We're willing. We're going to experience rather simple miracles, and we can't experience simple miracles in our daily lives, number two, when we are willing to confront our failure. When we are willing to confront our failure. Listen to verses 5 and 6 of Luke 5, and Simon answered, after receiving this call that he's got to be obedient to, that he's hesitant and he's vacillating about it, but, but he answered, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And the Bible says when they had done this, they brought in a great catch. And I thought about that Saturday when what started out good began to go bad. It was obvious the things that I had failed to account and to plan for. It was obvious that we had given thought 
to how to have an successful, uh, to how, how to have a successful event that would appeal to young men, but we hadn't thought about how to integrate the young women into what was going on. That was a failure on our part. And it's similar to Peter's experience in Luke chapter 5. Check it out. Jesus beckoned Simon to launch the boat out into the deep to go deeper and to go further and to go farther with God. But listen to what Simon says on the other side of the instruction. He's going to be obedient, but before he gives obedience, he's got to give some context. Simon says, Lord, I want you to understand. We have been fishing all night. We've been at this all night and we have caught nothing. I want to pause here because I don't think you should rush past that because Peter is a fisherman. And in the parlance of fishermen, in the vocabulary of a fisherman, in the lexicon of a fisherman, in the vernacular of fishermen, having fished all night and caught nothing is basically admitting and acknowledging failure. Check that out, that before Jesus blesses Peter with the miracle, he's got to force Peter to confront his failure. And I want to tell you that I have discovered that it is easy to point out other people's failures, that it is easy to have an eye and place a spotlight and to point out and to distinguish how other people have failed, but that the difficulty and the growth happens when we can acknowledge uh, and confront the places and spaces where we have failed. Can I tell the truth tonight? I love, I love to learn and to hear when I've done a good job. I love to have my ego stroke. It's good for my ego, but it's bad for my execution. Why? Because I can languish in the praise and never move to productivity. And I want to tell you tonight that it is fine to celebrate success, but it is more important to heed the lessons of our failures. Somebody ought to just type that in the comment section. Learn the lessons of failure. Learn the lessons of failure. Learn the lessons of let down. Learn the lessons of when it doesn't work. Learn lessons from when life goes left. Learn lessons from when it doesn't go the way that you thought that it was going to go. And so I am learning now how to confront failure, to be honest about what doesn't work, to tell the truth about why things are broken, to have the courage and the honesty to discourse and have uncomfortable conversations about why and how things can be better the next time. And I want to tell you, church, that miracles happen when we are willing to confront our failure. Tell me this, what do you do when what you're doing don't work? What do you do when what you're doing don't work. When you discover that what you've been doing ain't working. And that's Peter's dilemma. Lord, we have fished all night and it didn't work. Lord, we wrote the business plan and it didn't work. We worked on the business plan and failed to get the loan. We launched out into the entrepreneurial space and the business failed. We tried for 10 years to sustain a marriage, and the marriage failed. We tried to give our children the best that we could, but our parenting failed. What do you do when what you've been doing don't work? The natural tendency is to make it everybody else's problem, to blame process, to blame bureaucracy, to blame personalities. And while the truth is probably scattered in all of those places, the most powerful thing I'm learning that we can do is to confront failure and take ownership over what we did that did not work. Jesus' word to Peter, watch this, is not just to acknowledge failure, but to confront it. 
hear me tonight. It ain't enough to acknowledge the failure. We got to take it a step further and confront failure. What does he say? Launch back out into the deep. Lord, we've been fishing all night. We didn't catch anything, but at your word, I'm willing to go back to the place where I failed and try it again and to work it again and to believe again. Why? Because the failure is not in the failing, but in failing to confront failure. Can I say it again? That failure is not in failing but in failing to confront failure. As the great Benjamin Elijah Mays would say, he said, low aim, not failure, is sin. He said, the sin is not having an aim for which to fail to meet. The Chinese philosopher Confucius said it this way, our greatest glory is not in never failing, but in learning to rise every time that we fail. And so, we experience daily miracles, miracles in the dailiness of our living when we are willing to confront failure and watch God turn failure into favor. I wish I had time to preach that tonight, that God will turn failure into favor, that God will turn failure, what didn't work, into all things working together for your good. Give me the next slide. I want to move on tonight. But next, we experience simple miracles in our daily lives when we are willing to hold each other's nets. Nets. Somebody ought to just put that in the comment section. Hold my net. Hold my net. Help me hold my net. Help me hold my net. Hold my net. And this is so important, so beautiful from the seven, from verse seven. I love verse seven. It says, they beckoned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. There is another miracle in the text. The miracle is that the ships begin to sink, but somehow they make it back to shore. I, I, that, that part blows my mind. They begin to sink. The fish are so heavy that the boat begins to sink, and yet somehow they make it back to shore. We experience simple miracles in our daily lives when we are willing to hold each other's nets. That, that harkens us back to the lesson from Sunday's sermon, uh, a powerful word uh, by Reverend Dr. Uh, Raphael Warnock, that we as the people of God are, con are called to convert the big crowd into beloved community. And the miracle happens, watch this, not when uh, Peter puts his net in the water. That's the first part of the miracle. But the miracle is concluded, the miracle is successful when there are other people who see Simon struggling with the net and make it up in their mind that they're going to come alongside to help. The Bible says that Jesus has convinced Peter to launch out into the deep. Simon is, has already told Jesus, Lord, we've been fishing all night. We ain't caught nothing. But nevertheless, at your word, I'm willing to go deeper with you through obedience. Nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to do what you say. The Bible says that as soon as the nets hit the water, Simon and his colleagues were so overwhelmed by how big the catch was that they needed partners. Somebody ought to just hashtag partners in the comment section. They needed partners to help them bring in the catch. I wonder how the text would have turned out if Peter had believed that he didn't need nobody to help him. But the Bible says that the haul of fish was so great that the nets couldn't even hold what was in them. My God, what happens when God blesses us and we don't have infrastructure to hold the blessing? Here it is. The, God blesses them, and, and the blessing is so overwhelming, they can't get it all on the boat. They need two boats. They need more than one boat because they are so overwhelmed with the catch of fish that the boats begin to sink. There's another small miracle that we need to pay attention to in the text because the Bible again says that the boats get back to shore even though they are overwhelmed and overrun with fish, overrun with harvest, overrun with goodness, overrun with the things that they said that they wanted, overrun with the things that they didn't have until they get Jesus on their boat and they launch out into the deep. It is so big, so overwhelming. The Bible says that the nets, in verse 6, that the nets begin to break. And there is a tendency to highlight the fact that the nets were broken and ignore why the nets were breaking. I'm going somewhere tonight. 
And I'm so glad that Peter identified other brothers in other boats as partners. Hear me tonight, as partners, not, not just as personalities, not just as powerful people with boats. No, these are partners. And what blesses me about this text, what blesses me about verse 7 is that even though they didn't get any credit, they still have no problem holding the net. They don't get the credit. No one knows their name. The only names that are called in the text are, are Simon, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee. But there were other brothers, other partners who were there with them. And even though they don't get the credit, they are willing to hold the net. And that embodies so beautifully the miracle that I saw this past Saturday as I saw the net just laying there in the floor with no one to claim it, with no legs to stand on so that someone could use it. I, I ran out of the gym looking and searching for who had delivered this net, who had brought this miracle, because I believed that if I could just find the owner of the net, then I could find the feet to the net, and then surely we could find the stands, and, and, it, and, it, and then things would turn out good because the net would be able to stand up. I couldn't find who had brought the net. Nobody knew where the nets had come from, which meant that nobody knew where the stands were. And so I returned to the gym defeated. I walked into the gym with my head held down because a disaster is turning into a catastrophe. But I walked into the gym to a blessed site. Give me the next slide. On one side of the gym was a basketball game. And on the other side of the gym, there's a volleyball game going on. There's a volleyball game going on on the other side of the gym. I, I'm walking into the gym. I'm defeated, but God gave me victory in my spirit because on one side of the gym, there's a basketball game. On the other side of the gym, there's a volleyball game. And what blesses me is that the volleyball game is going on because Ben and DeAnthony are holding the nets. Some of y'all missed that. That went over your head, but that's okay. Because, the, because for the remainder of the time that we were in the gym together, the girls got to play volleyball, the boys got to play basketball, and God got the glory because someone was willing to hold the net. And I just want to ask tonight, who do you have in your life? Who is in your community that is willing not to be critical of you because they see that God is blessing you so profoundly? They, they understand that you don't have the infrastructure to properly contain the blessing. And so instead of criticizing you, instead of putting you down, instead of being jealous of you, instead of ignoring you, instead of acting like a miracle ain't happening in front of them, who will come alongside you and hold your net? Who holds your net as you're straining and struggling and pulling and yanking and trying and toiling and sweating and burdened and overwhelmed and overworked and underpaid? Who holds your net? Because I'm sure there were a lot of other boats in the sea who looked at Peter struggling, saying that he should have known better and asking why he didn't think of that and trying to figure out why if it had been their boat, they would have had this, but Peter don't have it. I'm glad that they had a different attitude, that their attitude was let me pull alongside and hold the net. Why? Because if Peter wins, then we all win. The Bible said there was enough, so much fish that both boats began to sink because there was someone willing to hold the net. That was a beautiful miracle to see on that on that Saturday because it signaled to me that we're not just a justice church that just talks about justice, but that our young people are listening to us, that they get it, that they understand it, and that they are willing to embody justice for each other. I need you to hear me tonight. The boys understood that even though they weren't playing fair, they had a duty and a responsibility to hold the net for the sisters. And that to me was a miracle. Let's go to the last slide. We experience simple miracles in our daily lives when we encounter destiny and purpose. Verse 11 says, and when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and 
followed him. And as this portion of Luke chapter 5 closes, we find Peter literally overwhelmed by the holiness of God. In, in the King James Version, it says, Lord, I cannot, I can't bear your holiness. And if I had time, I, I would take that apart and, and delve into that a little bit more. But I think this is a great metaphor for what it means to love for the people of God. The Bible says when they got back to the shore, they dropped the nets and everything else to follow him. Fishermen are in love with fish. Peter is in love with mission. And even though there's a boat full of fish that's sinking because it's full of fish and nets that are breaking because they are overwhelmed with fish, he, even though he had caught a catch that he probably could have sold it all and lived as a millionaire or a billionaire the rest of his life, the Bible says that when he got to shore, despite the fish in the boat and despite the fish in the net, he dropped everything to follow Jesus. And maybe it's cliche to talk about what it means to find the love of your life, but I think it's, it is still perhaps appropriate to talk about what it means to find purpose for your life. And Peter embodies for us the, the miracle or the miraculousness that we encounter whenever we come face to face with purpose. And we pray, well, I'm, I pray, people I know pray, when they go to the, to the gas station to get those lottery tickets and they just believe that it will be a miracle for them to become rich in money if they can just hit those numbers and they ignore, though, the great wealth that is to be theirs and to be ours if we would but commit ourselves to destiny and purpose. Hear me tonight. All month long, we have ministered to young people who are and have begun to discern God's purpose and plan for their life. And that in and of itself, y'all, is a miracle that when they will have spent themselves in this life, they will be able to say that I spent everything that I had pursuing my purpose. That's a miracle because I know people who are 34 and 44 and 54 and 64 and they've got money and they've got power and they've got status, but they are empty because they have lived their life chasing fame and power and status and statues to them and to their legacy, but they have yet to discover their purpose, the thing that makes them come alive, the thing that you wouldn't have to pay them to do. They just get up out of their bed and do it for free because they love to do it. And there are so many people who live empty lives and they stay on the shallow end of life's pool of God's, the pool of God's debt because their goal is money. Their goal is success. Their goal is fame. Their goal is status. When what God has for them is greater than gold, it is greater than money. It's greater than fame. It's more powerful than, than status. It is to be drunk on the wine of your own on purpose. It is to be inebriated with the thing that God has called you to do. And the failure in such a life, the failure of a life that is predicated only on status and fame is that it reaches for things and tries to make a life out of things which provide no substance and, and place no burden, no significant challenge upon us to reach out and to touch destiny. But I want to talk to someone who is listening to me tonight to know that there is a miracle that is a waiting for you, the moment that you discover your purpose, the moment that you discover the reason why God has placed you here. And for Peter, it was the ability to connect with Jesus, a man who would make him a fisher, not just a fish, but a fisher of people. And for somebody else, it's a book that needs to be written. For someone else, it's a story that you've got to tell. For somebody else, it's a history that you've got to recollect. For someone else, it's a business that you've got to start, a, a, a project that you must fulfill. But I want to tell you tonight that the miracle that is awaiting you is on the other side of your discovery of destiny and your close encounter with your purpose. Let today be the last day where you 
you are satisfied and fulfilled by money and status and fame. No, tomorrow, wake up with an unquenchable hunger to find destiny and to live a life of purpose. I'm thinking about one of the one of well, one of my favorite philosophers, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who said, "He who has a why for which to live can bear." almost anyhow. That's right. If you have a why for which to live, you can bear almost anyhow. And so we encounter again the simple miracles in our daily lives when we encounter and when we discover destiny and purpose, when we are willing to hold each other's nets in beloved community, when we are willing to confront our failure and when we are willing to deepen our trust in God through obedience to him, not to the preacher, not to a man, but to his word, to God and his word. And that's the word of God for the people of God. We say thanks be unto God. There might be someone who's listening tonight and you've yet to connect with Jesus. You've yet to lower your net and to allow Jesus to bring to you a great catch. You've yet to connect with destiny and purpose. You're still searching, trying to find your place to stand. You have yet to confront the failure of your sin. You've yet to live into all that God has for you. I, wanna, I want you to know tonight that we as a church wanna hold the net for you. We wanna hold the net for you so that you can get to a God who has destiny and purpose for you. There's a number right now on the screen. You can call that number 469-498-0210. And someone is prepared right now. They're waiting to hold the net for you, to pray with you, to pray for you, to offer you a plan of salvation, to connect you with this life-affirming church, this justice-seeking church. Pastor Haynes would love to be your pastor. We would love to be your church home. Call that number, connect with us, and become a part of what God is doing here. Matter of fact, you might say, preacher, I, I don't have a church home. I'm, I'm, I've never heard this message of Jesus before. I, I want to be a part of what God is doing. I want to drop my net and follow Jesus. I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. And when we say amen, we believe by faith that you're already saved. Gracious God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you came into this world in the form of your son, Jesus to die on Calvary's cross just for us, to make us a part of your family, to adopt us, to be a part of the kingdom. Thank you, God, for what you did on Calvary. Thank you now for that gift of Jesus. I invite you into my heart. Come into my heart. Thank you for coming into my heart. Now live your life through me. To thine be the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. And amen. Don't forget that you can give, you can pour into this awesome ministry known as Friendship West. This justice-seeking work goes on. The work goes on. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few, and the resource needs continue to grow. As the economy worsens, as people are in desperate and dire need for resources, God continues to call Friendship West to the front lines. And church, we can't do anything that we do, from feeding the homeless to... Uh, provisioning our VIPs with foodstuffs and hygiene products and other kinds of resources to the things that we do for families in terms of utility. None of the work that we do, we can do without you. And so we invite you now to sow a seed, to pour into this ministry, to give back to God a portion of what God has blessed you with so that we can continue to ensure that justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. There's several ways to give that are now on your screen. You can give online or using the Friendship West app. You can go to friendshipwest.org or you can download the FWBC app from any app store and you can give there online. You can also use the Givelify app, download the Givelify app, search Friendship West and you can give on the Givelify app as well. You can also text to give by texting FWBC to 972 -294 19. One more time, that's FWBC. 
And you can text that to 972-200-9419. As a matter of fact, if you don't want to do that, you can just use your phone right now and scan the QR code that is on your screen. Right now, you can scan to give from your living room, from your dining room table, as you're at work, at your desk, wherever you are. Take your phone out right now. Use your camera, uh, use your camera application and scan our scan to give QR code and you can give there as well. One final announcement we want to make sure as we continue to support and celebrate and lift up health and wellness, I want to remind you of Faith Formula's Health and Fitness Expo this Saturday, Saturday, September 3rd from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We got fitness classes that will be offered, health and wellness ven uh, vendors, fresh, uh, uh, free fresh produce. Shout out to the word free. Free fresh produce, courtesy of our courtyard pantry. And for more information, you can visit www.faithformula.org for more details, again, about this powerful health and fitness expo this Saturday, Saturday, September 3rd, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Family, you do not want to miss that. Well, it is been a blessing for us to be here tonight. We pray that as you go throughout your uh, the rest of your week that you are reminded of the miracles, the small miracles in everyday places and that you won't hesitate to help someone pull up the net. You'll let down the net yourself and trust God for a tremendous miracle. Let's get ready to go as we go from this place, but never from God's presence. We pray God's choices, blessings. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for this night of worship, for the profound way that you have spoken to us out of your word. We ask right now, oh God, as a church family, that you would keep our pastor again safe and healthy and well, that you would cover his family, that you would cover all those who work here at this branch of Zion and all of the families who are connected to this place of worship. We ask, oh God, that we will be blessed in our going out and in our coming in. We ask that you would bless every place where our foot shall try. We, we speak, O oh God, with great expectation as we await the word on Sunday. We pray for a fresh word. Anoint now our pastor. Give him preaching power that makes preaching easy. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive and to feel the move of the Holy Ghost. Lord, again this week, we ask that you would remind us of the miracles that are all around us if we will be attentive to them. These and all other blessings we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, according to your word, we count it done and say. We praise God for this impactful experience and for your joining us during it. Check us out on social media and please like, share, and subscribe at Friendship West. Then go to www.friendshipwest.org to find out more about this marvelous movement. Find out how to participate through sharing your prayers, sharing your offerings or monetary gifts, or sharing and investing your time volunteering with this difference-making ministry. For you who are viewing as visitors, you can share that you are here by taking time to text FWBIZ to the number 28950. For those who want to, this time that you are visiting to be the last time that you are a visitor, you can become part of our fabulous family of faith either by calling 469-498-0210 or by emailing join us at friendshipwest.org with your first name, your last name, and your cell number. Either way, we look forward to hearing from you. We're so excited that you are here. Until next time, blessings on you. Friendship West Baptist Church.